Well, good morning. I tell you what, it's such a thrill to stand in front of you and be able to share a few minutes, talk to you about some thoughts that are in my head. This place is so important to me. Uh, I've learned here to be challenged in my thinking and to be allowed to think for myself. Uh, we came from just from the 9 o'clock session where other people shared stories about places that were meaningful to them, and I felt like I wanted them to all stand up here and just share their little comments because it was so wonderful to hear uh, and learn from them. And I've learned so much being in here with the people who serve the community, who all reach out, who uh, are so accepting. This is such an inclusive place. And another big thing that's been important to me is it's part of my journey from way back. Always went to church as a kid, went to church every Sunday. I wasn't sick, probably, and uh, I enjoyed it. Somehow I always liked being in church, unlike my kids. Um, and I realized from that journey from there to here how in those days, even though I was kind of theologically minded and I really uh, tried to understand the doctrine and believed it all, uh, as I moved away from that to a place where we thought for ourselves, where we didn't have to stick with the old texts all the time, that what I really loved about church wasn't the doctrine or even the songs or all that. It was the people and getting together on a regular basis with really great people. So thank you for being that people. I really have enjoyed Kent's series about Tara. I know everyone else seemed to too. I've heard many comments. And it's meant a lot to me because the idea of an uh, ethos of the earth, it just should strike us all as, okay, we're the people. We're the ones who think, what are we going to do with this beautiful world? And so uh, I put my little talk together. Uh, I'm going to confess uh, it was a pretty disjointed venture. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to thank all the people up here already because it meant so much. They have wonderful music, and whew, I can hardly talk about uh, Cindy's uh, meditation because that was such a touching experience to be here when uh, Keith was here and to hear it again. And I'll tell you what really hit me. Well, Kevin up here, I'm trying to understand how is it I approach stuff. You know, uh, I'm not always the most observant person in the world. You could ask um, my wife. Maybe you would not want to ask her, for my sake. But uh, I'm always trying to figure out, how is it that my brain works? And when Kevin said, uh, here's this blank page. Use your imagination, and you'll fill it in some sort of, you, those, some form of your words are like that. And I thought, oh, yeah. I might seem a little vacant up there once in a while, but... <laughs> But imagination does help. And uh, so I thought what I'd start with is a, a thing I wrote a few years ago. And I do find that uh, uh, thoughts and imagination that turn into something kind of start some place. And a favorite place of mine is uh, a chair of mine that is now shared occasionally with Cheryl, uh, where I can see out the back window uh, into our backyard. I try to sit there and read or write or sometimes I just stare. And uh, so that's where this started. This is called Window Epiphany. I was doing nothing much between a nap and book, idly staring at the glass, the window in my wall, when casually I thought that wall was painted by my wife. The paint came from the store nearby, sold by Bob, a helpful guy. I thought some more. I bet three dozen people work to make that paint. Oh, more if transportation's added in and people washing floors and maybe 30 sources for the varied stuff mixed in. A hundred people for our paint seemed sensible to contemplate. People, I suppose, like me with family and friends and folks they don't like too, working, playing, fighting, loving, worrying, and hoping, somehow making do. 
I stared surprised at what I saw there in our simple painted wall. Then my eyes glanced through the glass toward our terraced hill and landed on the cat mint that I had planted just this spring. When I work at pulling weeds, I love its bracing smell. The green is chlorophyll, I think. Photosynthesis at work? Three billion years life's been on Earth. I've looked it up. With starborn carbon at its core, cycled not just once or twice, but a million times, then millions more, in plants, in beasts, and people too. It's a cosmic past for you, me and you. Now, I don't know if I saw God in simple plants and paint, or only playful thoughts. I'm certainly no saint. But when a hundred folks connect to me in my own wall, and atoms with a million lives incarnate flowers on my hill, that's revelation good enough for me to love it all. So uh, I think that kind of observation comes to a lot of us. It's, it, it's a one thought. We might see something. Someone might be much more observant than I am. And uh, uh, one thought leads to another. And your imagination is really important in helping construct what the world is to you. Uh, I, I didn't even mention at my uh, beginning that I struck this poem or thought about it, uh, and these, uh, what I'm saying today, around Mary Oliver's poem, which we've heard several times here, Wild Geese, wonderful poem, but the last few lines contain the words, uh, your place in the family of things. And I thought, well, all these thoughts, observations, help us kind of find our place in the family of things. Um, Let's see, what was I going to mention next? Uh, I'm in a poetry group. I don't know if there's anybody in here today that's in it. Oh, yeah, we have Jenny and Bob are here, and uh, Betty, I think. In the poetry group, we read a poem that often we've read the, written ourselves, and then there's a little feedback. And someone had a piece that had uh, some space in it, a natural kind of open space. I don't recall if it was a sky uh, a sea or a, a canopied forest, and uh, it was really nice. And then uh, one of the fellows, Ken, he said, you know, there's a, something about a space like that that brings something out of you that's inside. And we, that kind of came up in our um, discussion earlier, too, that uh, we like a natural space that seems to give us space to be something more. There's also, I think, another side of that that I should mention, and is that a space can uh, change us. It doesn't just bring out what's within, but it might change us because uh, of who's there or what it is. This place has changed me over many years because of who's here and what we do together and what we say. On the other hand, and that's positive, on the other hand, maybe a space like a political rally or a cult situation where everyone repeats what everyone else says and it builds into a, a, an irrational kind of a, a sports cheer, a chant, uh, that space could have a negative effect and actually change the person who goes there. Um, and along that line, I want to say I love natural spaces too. But whenever we talk about nature, it's like there's always that other side, you know. Uh, it's not all pretty. We want to go back to nature, and when we look close at nature in itself or what we've done to it, it's not so simple. And um, uh, so I, uh, I got out of order, so I'm going to read that poem that has to do with that. This is called, The Earth Does Not Cry Out. 20,000 years ago, along the Sea of Galilee, the people scored the earth to sow their seeds. They fed themselves with cereal while the bare earth sprouted weeds. The earth did not cry out at such a minor harm, and the humans shouted no alarm. About 2,000 years ago, the Romans went to work at cutting stones to build a road for armies and their food and gear. The wagon wheels and horses' hooves clattered through the cultured world. But the Appian Hills did not cry out. 
And today at Minnesota's Hall Rust Mine, a 30-story high machine gouges out a quarter million tons of earth a day to fill our iron demand. Factories humming, contracts kept, people earning pay, and still the earth does not cry out. But all those alterations of our globe seem trivial when they are held beside our heated air. The glaciers melt, the salt seas rise, the tundra leaks its methane into the air, and carbon chokes the sky above. And yet, the earth does not cry out. Dear world, where is your cry of pain when you are cut? Your anguish for the human family. Are you not the mother earth who birthed this verdant place, who made a home of gull for gulls and bears, and us, the billions, who can think and till and build? But perhaps we've missed a prologue in our dour review. Six million years ago, a wandering six-mile rock from space struck the ground of what we call the Yucatan like 30,000 nuclear bombs. The dust and soot that circled Earth turned day to night and brought a winter that destroyed over half the life on Earth. And no, the Earth did not cry out. When some of us were not yet born, tectonic plates outside Sumatra's coast slid up just yards and built a tidal wave that crossed the Indian seas and killed 200,000 of our race. And our earth said not a word. So billions of us think and till and build and live our busy lives, but who will love this home enough to give the, it the thought that it deserves? Who will learn and speak the truth to set our actions right? For this home of all the life we know, for our children's children and this splendid, awful place, who will now cry out? I um, almost feel like apologizing, but this last quote that was in the bulletin from Aaron Cunningham, I just came across it somewhat by accident on the internet. Uh, it, I won't reread it, but uh, it has to do with the indifference of the universe. And some of us, I understand, feel like there is a beneficent uh, something behind the universe. I'm not so sure. And whether we believe that or not, it seems like it's we, the human beings, who have to figure out what to do about it. I don't think anybody's going to come and help. So uh, let me go to this, a little more uh, sanguine piece like I was saying, we all like to go to a natural, and I mentioned earlier in the other uh, group, uh, I think we usually say natural when we mean nature without people, <laughs> right? I mean, we're part of the whole picture, too. We're uh, a major uh, part of the web of life. There's no separation, but we like that more natural place, and I think that's great. Uh, people shared about places that they love in our talk earlier, too. I, uh, we live out on the edge of town with a nice woods out back. That probably is my favorite place to just stand and be. And it's not a great big forest, but it's big trees, and it just feels great. And this is almost autumn. I forgot to look at the time when I started. I won't go more than an hour, so uh, <laughs> I'll try to keep an eye on the clock back there. Um, uh, so it's almost autumn, trees will turn soon, and so I'll share this. It's called Beautiful the Billion Leaves. See how beautiful the billion leaves, when limbs that lent them life have ceased their summer flow. The sun, the high priest of the autumn rite, shines on no pallid corpse, for nature's lethal alchemy turned green to yellow, orange, and red. Now watch a solitary leaf let go its limb and one-time source of life, then rock to and fro in slow descent until it rests on earth from where its life once sprung to lie with countless others 
in the fall communal wake. Soon worms and mites have at the lovely corpse a million organisms parse its frame, fine and dark, to join the forest's floor. Perhaps from there, our one-time leaf, still disciple to Earth's procreant creed, will rise in time, investments green, and join again the sylvan host. That sounds a little religious, doesn't it? <laughs> I didn't leave all that stuff behind, I guess. A uh, little, little word uh, usage there that I, I admitted to the group earlier. It just stuck back there, and when I try to write something, you know, it just kind of, well, it's into my imagination automatically, I guess. Um, and I'm sure we all have a place like that, and it's maybe many places or maybe one place. We have not traveled a lot like people of Grand Canyon or other natural places. Uh, and a lot of times it's probably just a place close to home uh, for you. Everybody has that one place to go and feel both in touch and a little bit away from people. But the interesting thing I found, find in looking at autumn and the leaves is it talks about death and it talks about change. So it's not like just looking at a natural setting and appreciating. It's like it speaks to us, you know. To me, that's part of uh, what Mary Oliver is talking about when she says the wild geese announce our place in the family of living things. And so uh, the dying leaves and the uh, composting earth on the ground talks to us too, I think. We're, we're part of that. Um, let's see. Since I got out of order, this will work. Um, it, we all approach this pretty personally. You know, like me sitting in a chair looking out the window. Uh, and our sharing this morning was all very subjective. We each have our own uh, view of the word, world. And certain places really stand out. I can't say that I ever had a single space. That, and I was trying to answer for myself what that place was that uh, Mary Oliver refers to in her poem. So this is what I put down. I hope it makes a little sense. I called it My Place in the Family of Things. Along the slough I walked, my brother at my side, I ten, he nine, spying wild daffodils, insects buzzing in our ears, now and then the plaintive screech of red-winged blackbirds perched on cattail stems. A barn brim full of magic housed in beams and bales and bellowing cows and pails of milk. A high school standing a stately three floors high of aging brick. Stairwells for flying up and down during the three minute gaps between math and Latin, lunch and gym. College in a little town where for me driving nails and painting clabbered houses counted just as much as English lit or Bible class. Another town, this town, for deeper roots and miles of lake and woods behind the house, a house of painting, mowing, grass, of saplings grown to heights of 30 feet, hydrangea, catmint, ferns, and yews, of children grown from small to tall and off to school, Oh, my place has not been one of walking on my knees. Oh, there were times of hurt and strife, but those had the sense to pass and let the world I loved take center stage where the treasured action was. No geese announced my place in things, but now and then the red-winged blackbirds in the woods out back screeched their song, reminding me of my place in the family of things. So that's pretty diverse. Not a single place, uh, but that's kind of the way uh, I absorb life. And I've just, I guess I've been uh, really fortunate in, in the middle of life where there are hardships and death and all that. I've always had the feeling that I was in a, a good place. And uh, I feel for those who don't have that. In fact, uh, 
Cindy sharing earlier about It's really hard to talk about the kids that are not in that kind of place. Okay, now I got out of order, so I'll figure out where to pick up from now. Okay? Let's do... I did this. I did that. I did that. I did that. Wow, I'm almost done. I had one more in here besides the final one, but it was a little long. You know what? I think I can put that in there. Let's do that. I I like to, uh, because I'm not always uh, attentive to details and can't can't put a lot of information together, uh, I I guess I'm good at taking the uh, higher view (laughs) of things. Uh, But I do think that... uh, in contrast to where we have to take responsibility and be concerned about this earth, there's also that kind of Eastern view that backs off and says, you know, it's too too easy to categorize good and bad. And um, uh, so I'm, this, it might sound boring, but I like this so you're going to get it. (laughs) It's called, The Earth Will Carry Us. When we have lived this summer with children building castles and digging moats at the beach, with parking lots roasted by the high sun, with aging folks sweltering in uncooled apartments, the earth will carry us to the place of autumn and then on to winter, where the sun slants low and the cold wind piles snow at the doors. It's the way earth's story goes. When we have borne our children, and they, like us, have moved through years of joy and strife, as they made families of their own or lived a solitary life, when we stay home evenings and rarely see old friends, the earth will carry us in its ark just as it did in youthful times from season to season and year to year. It's the way earth's story goes. When we have seen a decade of misery meted out by humans on their neighbors, when earth is aflame with the dross of heedless human human living, and we are losing hope, still the earth will carry us from year to year and generation to generation, generation patiently around the sun, and do the same for all that dwell on its tender soil. When you and I and all the folks who now call this world their home have lain as dust for 10,000 years and our homes and streets are hidden far beneath earth's soil, when humans then, should they survive, feel a new life's joy and pain and for their children hold bright hope, season by season and age by age, the the great earth will carry them lightly on. It's the way Earth's story goes. And I think we can do the end of this. I, uh, you know, after hearing the wonderful music and the uh, uh, meditation by Cindy and the uh, sharing here, and then, of course, I had to pick Walt Whitman's quote, which I just go nuts. I just love it. I thought, I don't want, I'm going to stay here. Let's go home. Uh, uh, but um, I wanted to think about the word spiritual or the word meaning or the word uh, weight. What's the weight in life? And uh, I think, you know, I have no firm ideas about God, even though I love that quote about Whitman. And uh, so I have got this to finish up with. And... Uh, I got two spoiler alerts. Well, for, this isn't a spoiler alert. It's a little lighter weight than uh, some of the things I've shared. But one spoiler alert, uh, I've read this here before. It's been a few years. It was on a day that we, uh, it was focused on fun, on the lighter side of life. Maybe jokes were even told. I don't quite recall. The other spoiler alert is the word God is in here quite a bit. 
<laughs> so. <laughs> now all I have to do is find it in my pile of paper here and we'll be good. I know it's here. Where did it go? Maybe I printed two poems twice, one poem twice. Do you think? I know it's here. Well, it was here. Somebody steal it from me? I'll look one more time. Oh, here it is. I separated my papers. Okay. It's good to introduce a lighter one with a lot of bumbling. <laughs> it's called, well, it's the first line is the title, I guess. I think God is brighter than we think. And bored with fat old books. I did good. What did I do, Chuck? Where'd it go? My, my voice disappeared. Am I here again? Oh, I'm not used to this. I think God is brighter than we think. And bored with fat old books and brick facades. I think she's in my favorite coffee shop. In the windows and the doors. Because God would want us walking in and looking out. And maybe God is in the girls and guys who serve my dark roast grande with no room. But maybe when I'm driving, God is in my car. I don't mean sitting on the seat. I mean in the wheels and in the tires and in the parts that make it go. Then again, wouldn't God be engineer and tune-up man if he had the time, I mean? He'd be great with wrenches and those test machines. Contrarily, maybe he would take the steering wheel. He'd drive real fast and watch the cornrows flashing by or get in the lane with arrows pointing out of town. He's probably into moving on and getting where he's never been. He'd want to find some waves to surf to view the Taj Mahal and see what's shaken at the mall. Uh, I notice when I type... My little finger goes astray and hits the Q when I want A. God's in that pinky, too, I bet. Perfection's not her thing. Or earthquakes wouldn't quake and bees would never sting. Oh, wait, just look with me at the blossoms on that tree. If branches loaded down with white are not divine, what is? And robins singing for their mates? God's tuning up to procreate. I think God is brighter than we think because he's spread himself around in life that's great and crummy too because life is where the action's found. I think she's in the whole darn thing and maybe nowhere else. How can she stand off somewhere like some supernatural force? And would she mind if we used uppercase to start our words for coffee shops and Cars and robins singing in the trees. For roads and corn and pinkies too. Then only say the G word when we sneeze. <laughs> Wasn't supposed to be that funny. <laughs> then I wouldn't oddly say he and she to name the wonder in it all including what's in you and me. Thank you.